In today's lecture, I want to talk about some themes both from the human condition and from the origins of totalitarianism. I'll start with some ideas from the human condition. For Arendt, it's important to talk about the human condition rather than human nature, because humans don't have an essential nature that is unchanging over time. Rather, we condition our environment and are conditioned by it in a reciprocal fashion. There is no fundamental essence to human nature because we are always both shaping and being shaped by what surrounds us. We all partake in a shared human condition, but there's no kind of bird's eye view of an unchanging nature outside of history. This is probably a familiar concept to us by now because it picks up on some of the themes from Hegel and Marx about the way that humans are shaped in relation to our environment. For Arendt as well, humans are a who rather than a what. We help define ourselves and we help define each other. The human condition is characterized by what Arendt calls, using a Latin term, the vita activa, or the active life. Now, the vita activa has three primary levels, we might say to it. The first is labor, and labor refers to our activity in terms of biological processes, creating and sustaining life, taking care of our physical needs. Now, the second level is work, which is activity in terms of the life of humans, the things that we create, the sort of environments or worldliness that we establish. So this vase is the product of work, not of labor in a rent sense. So she's using labor and work in pretty specific ways. Art is also an expression of work for a rent. The third level of the Vita Activa is action. And this refers to activity in the sense of the social life of humans. The life of action is undertaken by humans as a collective or as a plurality. The life of thinking, the life of politics are part of this domain of action. So thinking is action for a rent. And action is the political activity par excellence. What characterizes humans is that we have this capacity to be what Aristotle calls political animals. Let's connect this idea of the vita activa to the origins of totalitarianism. Because in this text, Arendt seems extremely concerned that we have given up taking on the challenges of the life of action of real political activity and engagement with one another and just sort of lapsed into this laziness of accepting the status quo and allowing our sort of baser impulses to take over. Arendt talks about how one of the origins of totalitarianism is isolation. When the political sphere of life, which for her means acting together in pursuit of a common goal, is destroyed and we start to pit ourselves against each other. We feel lonely in a political sense. We don't want to talk politics with each other. We don't feel like it's important for us to be political. We feel a sense of powerlessness to change the status quo. And this isolation in a political sense can breed loneliness about human life as a whole, which he discusses on pages 474 and 475. We have this experience of not belonging to the world at all, which she says is a common ground for terror. This experience of loneliness and isolation, perhaps paradoxically, is actually a shared experience of the ever-growing masses, she says on 78. So what is the mass and how is it that we live in an era of the masses, even as we live in an era of extreme loneliness and isolation? Arendt describes the mass as not being held together by any sense of common interest or goals. They might actually have common interests and goals, but they don't recognize themselves as such. And she describes how both the Nazi and communist movements recruited members from the mass of people who are apparently indifferent, these people that the mainstream parties had given up on because they saw them as indifferent, maybe even as lazy, as lacking motivation. And I want to just note for you here that 
you probably have already picked up on some disturbing parallels to the present time, and there are more to come. Arendt is trying to figure out here how Germany in the 1930s became a bastion of the Nazi party when previously there had been a republic. And here are a few of the many, many elements that she draws on. So she says that totalitarian movements end the illusions of a democratic society. And there are two in particular that she focuses on on page 313. The first is the illusion that the people as a majority had taken an active part in government. The reality was, she says, that a democracy functions according to rules that are actively recognized only by a minority. So ma majority rule is often not the actual case in a democratic society, but democratic society pretends that it is. And the second illusion is that the indifferent masses, people who were politically apathetic, didn't matter, right? It's like, oh, you know, there are plenty of folks who don't really have strong political affiliations. They're just sort of apolitical. They don't do politics and they don't want to discuss them. Democratic society functioned under the illusion that those people didn't matter. But what actually totalitarian movements, such as that of National Socialism, recognized was that these people could be enlisted for totalitarian projects because of their feelings of isolation and loneliness. One of the first signs of breakdown of the party system in a democracy is the failure to recruit members from the younger generations. Younger generations come of age and they're like, what do I care about politics? That's just not my deal. Another is the lack of silent support of unorganized masses. A mass of furious individuals who seemingly have nothing in common start to develop. What they have in common is precisely their sense that party members are doomed and that the powers that be are stupid and fraudulent, she discusses on page 315. The self-centered bitterness of the masses develops hand in hand with their increasing lack of care for their own self-preservation. The masses sort of start to go haywire and self-destruct and they're okay with destroying themselves and others around them. These are extremely dangerous conditions for totalitarianism. Arendt gives a very useful summary of totalitarian government on page 460. Totalitarian government transforms classes into masses. It also supplants the party system by a mass movement. Importantly, Arendt says, the origins of totalitarianism aren't so much in a one-party dictatorship as they are in a mass movement that's not really driven by any particular goal. Totalitarian government also shifts the center of power from the army to the police. And in addition, it establishes a foreign policy that is openly directed towards world domination. She says on page 462 that totalitarianism is lawfulness without legality. One thing that totalitarian governments tend to do is supplant legality with laws of history and or laws of nature. For instance, the idea that a particular people is destined to dominate the world, right? In the case of National Socialism. In this sense, humans are taken to be swept along by a force outside of them. And Arendt mentions actually Darwin and Marx here as examples of this very troublesome idea. Actual laws that are context specific begin to be replaced by total terror, which she says translates into reality the law of nature and or of history. This idea that you are being swept along by forces and you can either be at the bottom or you can be at the top. Terror is the essence of totalitarian domination, she says on page 464. Terror makes us think that we are nothing but the pawns of nature or the pawns of history. We are not free. Terror eliminates freedom and the source of freedom. One of the many ways it does this is through undermining our capacity for action, which is the third level and the highest level of the Vita Activa. Recall that thinking is one of the components of action for a rent. Totalitarianism undermines our capacity for free thinking. 
in part because it causes us to question the distinction between reality and fiction and to conclude that there is no valid distinction to be made. So on page 474, she says that the ideal subject of totalitarian rule is not the convinced dogmatist. It's not the person who says national socialism is the best political philosophy out there. I'm going to hang my hat on it and that's that. No. The ideal subject of totalitarian rule is the person for whom fact and fiction, true and false, no longer have any relevant meaning. They don't have any relevant distinction such that somebody can say this is the right view or this is the wrong view. I want to close by saying something briefly about ideologies, which Arendt addresses here. She says that ideologies are not inherently totalitarian, but they do have totalitarian elements. And an ideology is an ism that can explain everything by deducing it from a single premise. Ideologies draw from the scientific approach and they pretend to be a scientific philosophy, right? Everything is organized around a particular principle, say spirit in Hegel. Ideologies pretend to know the mysteries of the entire historical process. And for Arendt, they're extremely troublesome because they reduce our freedom by replacing it with a straight jacket of logic. Everything can be explained, and not just explained, but explained away. The claim to total explanation that we find in ideologies intersects with ideology's independence from experience. An ideology doesn't think it needs to draw on the evidence of experience, because all it does is explain phenomena by deducing them from overarching abstract a priori principles. So for instance, something like alternative facts, I think Arendt hints at on page 471, where she says that in ideology, different facts can change their reality in accordance with their claims. You might think about the way that a supporter of QAnon is always going to be able to fit in a particular belief that seems to contradict their belief system with another belief that makes sense of the apparent contradiction and says, no, actually, this can fit back in to the QAnon narrative. In the end, ideologies have an unreal consistency, as Arendt describes them. Reality, she notes, is not itself consistent. And so anytime we're able to find a perfectly consistent picture, whether of history or of nature, we are finding ourselves in a very troubling situation where we're not letting ourselves be taught by reality. We're trying to slot everything in to a predetermined set of principles deduced from one overarching principle, but that doesn't do justice to the messy nature of reality, of the world as it is including the inconsistent and unpredictable character of human freedom.